Thank you, Davide, and thank you uh, uh, for this kind invitation to come here to the Um And have to say that I have the pleasure to give the first talk on experimental work in this this uh, conference or meeting. So I'm coming from uh, Technical Research Center of Finland, and before going there, I will or just to work, I'll just show a couple of slides of our institute. So VTT is a national research institute. Uh, it's the largest in the Nordic countries. There are about 2,500 employees, and uh, the turnover is a little bit less than 300 million euros, which translates to 350, 370 million dollars. And it is uh, truly multidisciplinary. And as you see, we <coughs> in Finland we have a real winter and we can have snow also. Um, and uh, this is a Micronova building in which I work and uh, we have 2600 square meters of clean rooms. And then the key topics here, this is for silicon fab. So it's MEMS, photonics, nanoelectronics. We have lots of things to work on, on superconductors and also several kind of uh, uh, nanofabrication uh, processes. And this is how it looks like inside. Uh, here are kind of a selection of just uh, examples of kind of things what we do. So there are MEMS oscillators, uh, graphene, bio, these kind of membranes I am going to talk about. Nanoelectronics, I also will uh, mention microfluidics, photonics, and, and, and also piezoelectrics and uh, superconductors. Okay, so the title of the talk is Thermal and Electrical Properties of Thin Semiconductor Membranes. And uh, here are the collaborators. So at VTT, there are Andrei Shepetov. Apo Varpula, Andrei Timofev, and Mika Prunila. Then there's a group of, of Sotomayor Torres, the professor in, in uh, Barcelona, in Spain. And uh, then we collaborated with uh, Sangamitra Neoki and Davide Donadio. Uh, sorry, I don't have the logo of Davis here. Uh, and uh <coughs> Sangamitra is, is uh, now in, in, in Colorado. Also, collaboration with uh, group by Thomas de Corsi, University of Constance, and, and, and then also uh, with Kang Chen uh, at MIT. So a uh, few words of motivation. Uh, if we take, let's say, the three main quanta, we have electrons, photons, and then phonons. And when we take a different combinations of these things, we can have, for example, electrons and photons. So we talk about telecommunication, photovoltaics, etc. Uh, photons and phonons. Then uh, there's an emerging field of optomechanics, and, and, and then uh, uh, phonons and electrons. So ICT, thermal management, thermoelectrics, and then and so forth. And here are some typical length scales for different particles. Uh, nanoscale MOSFETs, well, there's a big problem, as it was mentioned yesterday, that Moore's law continue, uh, I mean, increasing the number of, of, of uh, transistors uh, on a chip, but uh, the clock frequency of these chips it stopped co uh, increasing already about 10 years ago, and uh, it, it leveled up to about 5 gigahertz. And the reason there is that uh, one cannot uh, go higher frequencies because of the dissipation and the heat produced in these uh, nanoscale devices. So this is one of the main issues nowadays. And, and uh, because of stopping increase the clocking frequency, for example, nowadays all our laptops have these multi-core multi uh, uh, chips or, or comp uh, units. And also there's a so-called term called black silicon, which means that uh, part of the silicon chip is, is idling while, while the other part is, 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 is computing. So there are some tricks to overcome this, this limit caused by this uh, uh, thermal, thermal uh, uh, or heat, that as it's called also sometimes. Uh, 
optomechanics, of course, it's an interesting uh, new field. There are many different kind of uh, nanoscale structures which would be very interesting for, for experimental data or investigations. Graphene we heard about yesterday. Uh, transition metal dye calcogenides is also a new emerging field and then all kind of nanowires as mentioned by, by Davide already. So, uh, then why we want to go to silicon and why membranes? So, silicon has very high crystalline quality, very high purity and controlled doping. And, and these statements kind of contradict a little bit what uh, Luis Felipe said yesterday about uh, defects in materials and uh, humans. So, we want to have as pure and, and good qu high quality. Is this on? So, another good thing there is that there's stable oxide, uh, sharp interfaces, and we can control using oxidation, we can control well the thicknesses. And of course, this is the most important semiconductor. There's a major industry, so the, all the fabrication processes and tools are there. Uh, CMOS, MEMS, NEMS, optomechanics. So, this is kind of a textbook material and structure to investigate the effect of, of confinement on electrical and mechanical uh, properties. So this is the outline. So I will, well, SOI silicon on insula insulator wafers are kind of a workhorse for us and actually for all the computers nowadays. So how they are made and how may we make these thin membranes uh, process, then I'll go through or continue a little bit with what Davide already told about thermal properties of thin membranes. Then I'll go back a little bit to our earlier work and um, show some results how the thickness affects on the electrical properties of, of, uh, uh, of uh, or devices with thin channels. A few words about application when these two things are brought together so we can, we can have some nice applications and then summary. So, SOI wafers and fabrication of membranes. So, silicon and insulator wafers, these are actually, well, most of the, I would say 90% of, of uh, let's say, computers are using these uh, SOI wafers. And uh, here is the fabrication process. So, we start just bulk silicon wafer, put some oxide on, on the top, and then hydrogen implant, the high dose of hydrogen there, so it has a certain distribution inside the wafer. Then this wafer will be turned upside down and bonded to a so-called handle wafer. And then this is heated up. So there are two things. So the interface is healed, so the, the wafer bonding takes place. But then the hydrogen starts to form bubbles inside and then they break the, the wafer. And then, and then this wafer will be uh, uh, polished. So this is a uh, cross-sectional TEM image of hydrogen implanted silicon wafer, so the doses are quite high and the hydrogen forms these micro cavities and then when this is heated up they form bubbles and the bubbles uh, progress this direction and, st and, and break the wafer. And this is actually the smart cut process which is the, the most important nowadays. Uh, at early times there was a CIMOX process which is um, uh, like uh, where they instead of uh, hydrogen they implanted oxy uh, oxygen and, and then he annealed it and, and it formed uh, silicon dioxide in, in, in between. With this process the typical thickness range is, is let's say from 200-300 nanometer down to about 10 nanometer thickness of, of already fabricated wafer. So the wafers look like this. So there's a handle wafer, silicon, and then silicon dioxide layer is filmed there, and then the top layer, which is the device layer. So um, how to make the membranes then? So we have this starting wafer, and then we just start to oxidize the silicon layer on top. And this oxidation is very well controlled and uh, it forms extremely uh, good interfaces. 
and the control of thickness is, is down to one, one nanometer and, and also one can go down to let's say two or three nanometer thick silicon layers. Then this oxide is removed, but now the problem there is that um, these kind of uh, thermal uh, processes, they create compressive stress in the um, SOI film. And when the membrane is released, meaning that etching from behind through the handle wafer and removal of the buried oxide, then this is the outcome. So it's the buckling uh, film. So this is a 37 nanometer thick, one square millimeter film, but it is kind of a the compress compressive stress is, is, is released and it becomes buckling. So we wanted to avoid this and, and then we came up with, with a, a process which we can use to make these kind of a flat membranes. And then it goes like this. So SOI wafer oxidation, then we put silicon nitride film on top and, and, and this now has tensile strain or tensile stress, and we can control the amount of stress there. And, and then we do the uh, etching from the backside, removal of the layers, and now we have a structure which looks like this. So we have the strain controlling layer here, and it pulls like a drum head uh, membrane or diagram the, the, uh, the uh, membrane flat. And this is in that sense uh, convenient because uh, one can first control the stress between about zero to one gigapascal. So that's one handle one can, uh, or nope, one can uh, uh, change or control the strain. Then, of course, thickness, the thicker this is, the, the stronger the effort or the force. And then the third one is, is the geometry. So uh, we can change this overlapping part which goes on the membrane says this ratio to this window ratio and, and this is also something that we can <coughs> use to, to control the, the strain and this works actually very well so we can make samples with uh, down to six nanometer five nanometer thick membranes and actually this is one millimeter by one millimeter so these are extremely robust robust uh, material so this is optical profilometer uh, uh, image or, or scan of this, so we can really make this this flat. Without this, the corrugation is just of, of the order of several microns. And the quality still uh, after release is very good. So there are TEM images obtained from the suspended membranes, from the central and edge part. So this is 37 nanometer thick membrane. Uh, so no defects, and, and then there's a, a, a nine nanometer thick membrane, so no defects, and the diffraction pattern gives a very nice, nice um, uh, spots. Have to say that if one keeps the electron beam on one spot for long enough time, and the membrane thickness is, is very small, then one starts to amorphosize this, but that that's eventually. So no defects, good crystal quality, and, and uh, well below 10 nanometer thick uh, membranes. And these were taken directly from this. So we had a special uh, 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 or sample holder in the TEM so that we didn't remove the, the membrane, I mean, from the wafer. So we used this kind of samples, which actually then had or created one problem so that we couldn't estimate the strain from the diffraction pattern because uh, the focus plane was a little bit uh, difficult to uh, kind of uh, define in our TM setup. So uh, we had to do something else to estimate the strain. Uh, and that is actually Raman spectroscopy. So there's a very nice uh, optical phonon peak at, at 520, one over centimeter of M number. And this peak shifts with, with strain. So we can use the shift, we can measure the, the oops. 
we can measure uh, the, the peak position and then from there get the, the strain in the membrane. Uh, and as shown later, uh, we use this uh, Raman spectroscopy also to measure the temperature. So the this same peak also shifts with, uh, with temperature and the shift can be calibrated and then uh, you can use this peak uh, shift as a thermometer to measure measure the, the, the temperature of the locally on the spot on of the membrane to get the thermal conductivity but I'll come back to that later so uh, here's an example of Raman measurements from different set of samples so this is now the 520 wave number peak and, and this is the bulk silicon so this is a reference and then there are three uh, different membranes with a thickness of 54 nanometer and then uh, three different samples with the thickness of 6 nanometer and uh, what is the parameter here this uh, RC this is just the ratio between this length and this length. So if this WC or this color width is zero, we have this kind of a buckling uh, uh, case. And then when we increase this ratio, the stronger is the strain effect. Uh, as you can see, the RC is increasing, then the peak shifts towards the lower number, so it means the, the strain. And then when the film or membrane is thin, the shift is large. So from this shift then one can get uh, the strain uh, and uh, this then translates to these kind of numbers in, in this set of samples. So this is now the ratio of these, these lengths here and then this is the strain and uh, th there are three different thicknesses or di di uh, different samples and the strain can go with this let's say geometry up to 0.15 uh, um, percent this of course has an effect on the band structure so this is a band structure of, of silicon so there are six equivalent band minima and uh, when this in-plane strain appli is applied, it means that these two out-of-plane valleys, their energy goes down a little bit, and then these, uh, the energy of these valleys increase a little bit. So there's a splitting of, of these this, uh, this band, band structure or energies. And the split is a few tens of milli-electron volts. Uh, so it's about the KT of the order. And uh, as mentioned earlier, one can uh, change the strain here and, and the geometry and the thickness of the membranes. And then so we kind of estimated that one can go potentially up to half a percent strain. So it means that the strain is rather, rather large already. Uh, and the strain has also uh, effect on the, uh, the, the uh, energy, uh, the band gap. And this is a little bit more difficult to calculate, but it can be estimated like this. So the change, the, the band gap decreases a little bit, and uh, it's also uh, of the order of a few tens of, of uh, milli electron volts. And so it is something that is detectable optically, for example. So this was the, the fabrication and effect of, of the silicon material and the membranes. So the thermal properties of thin membranes, then uh, this was already explained by Davide quite thoroughly. But uh, let's see. So basically, well, optical and acoustic branches of, of uh, phonons, this is how this person relations of silicon uh, in reality it looks like uh, and the thermal properties are mainly as explained already uh, today uh, are 
dictated or defined by this this uh, acoustic branch branch here the linear part uh, and uh, when one makes a thin membrane then it means that uh, there begin to uh, uh, appear standing waves kind of phonon confinement and then the frequency shift is this goes one over the thickness of of the the, the cavity thickness so the thinner thinner the cavity the of course larger the the, the shift uh, so the first observation of these confined phonons was uh, actually published 2004 it was a co collaboration between uh, Clevia's group and, and, and these were more uh, detailed explained in the paper 2008 so this is the measurement brilliant uh, scattering measurement and this is the model and these actually fall one over straight line one over uh, the thickness e. now here the thickness the different peaks are at different thickness samples so this is kind of a fingerprint of of this um, this kind of standing waves in in these uh, membranes so now the thermal conductivity so the i mentioned already that uh, the raman peak this uh, 520 uh, one over or wave number it shifts uh, when the temperature is changed so this is the measurement setup so uh, sample is here the exciting light comes here and then there are set of detectors that measure the power and there's one to measure the transmitted power one of the for the incident light and, and then uh, the reflected power so when putting these together then one actually knows the power absorbed into the membrane so mm, here are curves measured so these are different thicknesses of, of membranes when power absorbed power is increased the temperature increases or there's a shift of the raman peak and these curves then can be fitted with this 2d heat equation where a is the sp spot size r is, is the, the, the coordinator and d is the thickness of the of the membrane and, and this we know now so we can calculate the, the kappa the thermal conductivity uh, a more sophisticated version of this uh, this uh, measurement technique is so-called two laser te uh, thermometry where there's one stationary heating laser which hits let's say the center part of the of the membrane and then there's another one with low power uh, which measures measures the shift of the peak meaning the temperature so here we can have the true profile of the temperature and then this can be modeled and again this this uh, thermal conductivity is obtained from the from this actually the slope or the logarithm of the slope and this has rather good spatial resolution and uh, with this technique you can get quite nice maps of, of the temperature there are some issues i'm not sure if clevia you are going to say something about the potential role of carriers generated or okay but um, so far so good uh, so the results from these measurements then so-called phonos in slow motion so when one tilts the measurement uh, the, the probing uh, beam then one can probe the in-plane uh, wave vector and properties and here is the measurement which is the first flexural mode and then and, and uh, this is now the wave vector or the get cut from the angle here and this is the frequency of the peaks measured and you can see that it's uh, quadratic, uh, this quadratic dispersion relation and uh, these are measured from several different thicknesses of, of membranes 
and it's quadratic, so then we get the phase velocity, which is linear, and then also the group velocity is linear on, on the wave, wave number or wave vector. And the whole set of measurements with uh, different modes looks like this, but when one focuses this uh, lowest flexural mode, then one can see that it's actually the, the dependence is linear. This is normalized uh, uh, wave vector, so multipli multiplied by, by the thickness. And these numbers really show that the, the phonon speed goes down. So this is phase uh, velocity, but also this applies to, to group velocity. So phonons move slowly. Uh, then, and this is now approaching what Davide claimed this morning, but uh, this is the uh, scattering rates of phonons, and this this is a measurement where is so-called asynchronous optical uh, sampling is measured. So there are two femtosecond lasers, which have a frequency difference of, of one gigahertz, which gives a one uh, nanosecond window for 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 the measurement. So there's one pump and a probe. And uh, this is now probing the first dilates, uh, dilatational mode, which means this mode, not flexural, but, but this mode. And uh, different thicknesses. Uh, so this is thickness, and because thickness decreases, the frequency of the of the, of the phonons increases. So this is these blue dots are the results. So there are uh, normal scattering and then thick samples, but then at uh, when the sample thickness goes down, then the boundary scattering or surface scattering sets in, and actually the effect is, is very strong. So it has three orders of magnitude reduction in, in lifetime. So by the way, the ASOP signals look like this, and then from this uh, decay, one can get this, this time uh, scattering or lifetime. And uh, this was already explained by Davide. So there are different different samples or different kind of uh, models. And uh, why these look like this is that the reason is that in real samples, when there's a native oxide on top of silicon, it looks something like this, roughly. So there it's a little bit undulating, the surface, and then, and then the thickness also, which is not shown here, but or it's not included here, but thickness of the oxide also varies a little bit. So this is something that is close to real samples. And then there are the clean, a little bit undulating surface, and, and then the sheer oxide. And uh, this was already shown by, by Davide. So the thickness itself doesn't make too big difference if one goes to a very thin membranes, the, the thermal conductivity doesn't change too much. But when one puts in the, the uh, oxide, it goes str very strongly down, and, and then adding also this little surface corrugation undulation, it still decreases the, the uh, thermal conductivity a little bit. And uh, as explained by Davide, these open uh, diamonds, these are uh, experimental data. So this is after HF dip, with HF dip removes the oxide but doesn't that, uh, touch silicon. Uh, so these are more or less kind of equivalent um, samples. And then this is a very thin oxide. And, and then uh, let's say after shelf life of a few weeks or something. So it's fully kind of a uh, grown native oxide on top of the sample. And Actually, the thermal conductivity goes down by a factor of 20 or something, so it is it's quite good. And uh, it has very strong effect, of course, or potential for the thermoelectric uh, application of silicon, as I'll show you later. This Davide didn't show, but um, this is also an inter in interesting graph. This is the accumulation function in these freestanding membranes for the same set of samples. And this is the thickness uh, of these as model samples. And if one take, again, this most realistic 
uh, case, then it is this curve, and this shows that 90% uh, of the heat conducted, conducted in, 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 in the membrane is by phonons with a mean free path less than 100 nanometer. So this gives kind of a feeling, as shown or pointed out earlier, what is the size or dimension scale that if one really wants to, to, uh, to start to modulate uh, the lateral movement of phonons by, by some, let's say, phononic lattices and so forth. But I think Livia is going to say something about this, this uh, tomorrow. So altogether, just to refresh the mind, so thickness goes down, then the thermal conductivity goes down, and uh, here is uh, just for reference, uh, if I recall correctly, 70 nanometer thick polysilicon. So f when the material becomes polycrystalline, of course, the grain boundary scattering increases, and then this is now about 20% of the bulk single crystalline silicon. So this is also one option for, for, of course, for applications. So the thickness doesn't have to be too small, and, and then, of course, this can be, polysilicon can be doped very well also. Uh, then I'll show some results of uh, electrical properties of these films, or how the thickness affects to the electrical properties. To start with, it's a single gate uh, SOI MOSFET. It looks something like this. So we have source and drain contacts. We have the uh, SOI channel, and the thickness of the channel is, is changed or modulated so that we can have... Okay, I'll come back to that later. And then we have polysilicon uh, gate. So this is the starting material, so we thin this part by using so-called local oxidation uh, process, so that we thin only this one. And then, then because the original wafers, which have this, this uh, SOI thickness, it's not all, over, all across the wafer, it's not 340 but it is 340 plus minus 10 or something. So it means that uh, in one wafer we have a nice set of samples with different uh, channel thicknesses. And uh, a real device looks something like this. So we have the buried oxide here. Uh, this is the silicon channel. So this is uh, uh, this uh, contact part, which is highly doped. And then this is a channel. This is the gate oxide, and this is the polysilicon uh, gate. And this, we, this thickness we vary from device to device. And there's a high-resolution image also from this channel, and it shows that the <coughs> interfaces are of very high quality and sharp. Uh, to avoid the phonon scattering, because uh, uh, we wanted to see the effect of the channel thickness on, 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 on propagation or on transport properties, so we went to uh, four Kelvin measurements. And uh, this is now the uh, carrier density and mobility measured from different set of devices with different channel thickness. Uh, when the channel thickness is around 60 nanometer or around, the peak mobility is about uh, 20,000, which is rather good for silicon. I know that there's one report from uh, Russia uh, when they claimed that they had 70,000 for silicon, but uh, I'm that's but 20,000 is quite good. I our best is, is I think 28,000, which is not bad. But the point here is that all these have the same peak mobility. So uh, at this stage, the, there's no effect on the channel thickness. 14 nanometer thick channel, then peak mobility drops. 13 it drops more, and uh, 50, uh, sorry, 11, so it drops even more. Uh, 
and uh, this is rather easy to understand. So there's a Schrodinger Poisson calculation of, of, of the, the system. So we have, uh, this is the, the channel, this is now in this case, this is a um, 20 nanometer thick channel. So at low, and this is the spatial fraction of carriers in the channel in the upper and lower part. So this is the upper half towards the gate, and this is the lower part towards the, the buried oxide. So at low gate voltage, which means low carrier concentration, the tail actually sees the back backside of the of the of the channel, and for some reason this interface is not as good as this one, and then this actually affects to the peak mobility uh, in this part at lower carrier density. If the carrier density is increased, the ma majority of the carriers are uh, at the front interface and they don't feel the backside anymore. And uh, this is what happens then. So the this all approach to the same same value. So this is rather understandable. Uh, and if we plot these peak mobilities for this set of samples, then we see that uh, when the channel thickness is around 20 or below, then we start to see that the decrease. But above 20 nanometer, there's no effect on, on the mobility. But the effect here is not that drastic, so it's still quite good quality of, of transport. To make things more interesting is to use dual gate or double gate uh, devices, which is otherwise similar. So there's a top gate, channel, but then this substrate is now highly doped silicon wafer and uh, we use this highly doped wafer as back gate. So, so this is uh, how it looks like, polysilicon gate here, channel and back gate. And again there are some high resolution TM images so that the quality of interfaces is quite quite nice. Uh, what we wanted to see here is the effect of so-called volume inversion or volume accumulation. Meaning that uh, instead of having the carriers at the edges of the channel, we can, by biasing uh, the, the gates in, uh, in a suitable manner, we can move the carriers in the middle of the channel. And uh, this has basically two effects. It's reduced scattering, of course, and this is because the uh, carriers don't feel the interfaces anymore or that strongly, but also if one spreads the carrier density uh, kind of across a little bit, well, across the channel, it means that the dimension in real space increases and uh, in the case space it reduces, and then that means that um, uh, the scattering with phonons is also reduced. So there are these two effects for, for to enhance the mobility by this uh, double gate structure. So here are some uh, uh, measurement data. So uh, this is now the top gate voltage and this is back gate voltage. And uh, this is 17 nanometer thick membrane and this is now at room, room temperature. These brown lines are equi uh, carrier density lines, so the carrier density along these lines is, is constant, and the black curves are, are the mobility measured. Uh, so if, let's say the other, say the back gate voltage is, is zero, so we are somewhere here, uh, and when we start to increase the back gate and keep the carrier density uh, constant, so we start to move here, from here, and you see that the, the mobility increases when we move to the center of the channel. And this is the indication of, of, of this uh, inversion accumulation. And this also, we can make these devices rather thin, so this is six nanometer thick channel, and we still have the same same um, 
effect here. Uh, these are the data plot, plotted in, in a little bit more, more kind of traditional uh, manner. So density of the carriers and mobility, so 70 nanometer thick. So these are when the carriers are on the top or bottom edge of the channel, and, and then this is in the middle with the volume inversion effect. And, and this is 600, uh, sorry, six nanometer thick membrane. The same, same thing. And uh, the mobility is. It's half, or, or but it's it's not completely disaster, even for these six nanometer thick membranes. So we can say here that uh, the electrical properties are not affected too strongly with the thickness, but uh, thermal properties are. I'm I'm not going to go in in, the in these things, but when one goes down into the low temperatures, one can see quite nice. Things in the uh, sublink over the house, um, uh, uh, measurements and, and so forth. Uh, another interesting thing what one can do with these kind of uh, uh, double gate devices is to have electrons and holes in the same channel. Uh, so the top gate and back gate are biased in such a way that uh, on the top of the channel one creates electron gas and on the back of the channel one creates holes, hole gas. And um, to actually do this, it's this is a little bit technology now, but one has to have to make contact both to electrons and holes, so we have kind of a double contact here, so there's a p-type and n-type contacts going into the whole bar channel, which was a little bit tricky to make, but but uh, doable. And what one can, for example, measure here is the trans resistance or kind of a drag when uh, one bias the system in such a way that one is here, then one have both electrons and holes in the channel, and then <coughs> when, for example, running uh, uh, current through the whole layer, one can measure the, the voltage in the in the in the um, electron layer, and one can see the uh, trans resistance here. Uh, I don't have the data here, but uh, when one does this, these are all at room room temperature. But when uh, one goes to temperature dependence, so there's uh, one part where at some point around 100 Kelvin and below, uh, when the temperature dependence is T squared, meaning, uh, meaning that there are two uh, 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 kind of uh, distributions of uh, free carriers, Fermi distributions, and, and then uh, below that, the problem is that the whole mobility gets very poor. It changes from, from kind of a 2D normal uh, conduction to something like a little bit hopping. And then when the temperature gets higher, there are some deviations from the T squared uh, dependence and that, that's probably where the phonon drag is, is coming around. So a few words about ap applications. So this was shown already by, by uh, Davide. So what we can play around is, of course, uh, the uh, Conductivity, electrical conductivity, that can be de by, by, by doping. Sebeck, uh, and uh, in case of uh, thermal conductivity, this doesn't play basically any role in, in semiconductors, so it's the, the phonon thermal conductivity. And as shown by Davide, so one can get, by when these are optimized, one can get uh, quite high figure of merit um, out of these or in these uh, these membranes. And the trick here is really that uh, one can increase this without, I mean, one doesn't affect too much of the electrical properties. One can go very high in, in the doping density and then this can be still separately actually reduced by, by going the thin, thin films. And then there was one paper uh, which has not been proven by any other group, but uh, it comes from from Japan, and they 
have they claim that when the doping density is close to 10 to 20, the Seebeck, this is Seebeck coefficient, it starts to increase already. So if this is true, then this number can be even higher. So three examples, so thermoelectric generator or cooler, and then a little bit maybe more interesting uh, sensors or bolometers. Here the problem is of course that when we are talking about freestanding membranes, we cannot use gates. So we have to bring in the carriers through doping and when this thickness is, is let's say below 50 or around 20 or something, this doping is, is extremely difficult. And especially when one has to have P and N type doping in the same, let's say, same membrane, it's technically very challenging. Um, and the aim is set go close to 10 to 20 per cubic centimeter carrier concentration, both P and N. And uh, this is our first set of samples which we got. So this is 30 nanometer thick membrane. And we have, from whole measurements, we have P-type is 8 times 10 to 19, carrier concentration and N-type is phosphorus, 5 times 10 to 19. So the resistivities are below 2 milliohm centimeter, which was close to what we aimed. They were a little bit lower than we, we expected, but anyway. So the doping effects a little bit, but not too much, on the thermal conductivity. Silicon is, is about the same mass, sorry, phosphorus is about the same mass as, as silicon. Doesn't affect too much, even. So this was measured using the laser, uh, the two laser Raman thermometry. And the thermal conductivity in both cases are around 30 watts per meter Kelvin. So here are examples of the devices. So this is a test device where we have two pairs, N and P, two pairs of, of uh, P and legs. And, and, and this is a picture of bolometer. And uh, using this one, one can actually, well, this is the, the current, one starts to run current through these two pairs. And uh, first, the and, and use the other end as a thermometer. So first, there's a Peltier effect sets in, so the temperature goes down, and then uh, joule heating hits in, and then it starts to increase. So one can fit this and get from there the Seebeck coefficient for a pair of legs. And uh, in our case, the number is 450 uh, microvolt microvolts per Kelvin. This was also checked uh, by Raman thermometry. So there is an uh, electrical contact here and here and now when one puts the laser spot close to the this contact one knows the temperature here and assumes that the temperature here is, 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 is uh, not uh, high it's, it's the, the let's say the bath temperature there one can then get by measuring the voltage between these two edges one can get the Seebeck coefficient so this doesn't give the proper number because one cannot put the laser spot on top of the contact but this gives kind of a, let's say, worst case estimate. And for N-type, this was 100 microvolts per Kelvin, and for P-type, a little bit below 300. So this is when one sums this, so it gives roughly the same number as, as we measured from this um, test device. So um, here's an example, another test device. So this is a silicon membrane thermoelectric generator with large number of legs. We had some problems with the contacts to this thin film, but at least when one heats this here, one can measure some voltage out here. So in principle, it, it works, but it, it needs some optimi optimization anyway. Then there are s a set of different kind of bolometers and uh, for example, this one here, this is again the 40 nanometer thick membrane. So it has these, these kind of beams and then the membrane is hanging there in the middle. And the beams are, are here we have P plus 
and uh, N plus leg, so and these are connected via uh, um, aluminum uh, contact, and then there's a heater on the other end of the membrane. So when one heats this, this is a test device heat using this, this resistor, then one measure the voltage here and then get the, the response. And uh, well, this is the setup. So there's a power goes in through the via this heater, then there's a heat capacity, and, and then the temperature raises here in this, this membrane, and it leaks out via the conductance through the legs. And putting in these numbers, we get the de de detectivity of uh, about 800 volts per watt, which is not world record, but it's not too bad for uh, the first device. Uh, this and this dictates the, the speed, and then we measured so that the rollover uh, frequency is, is somewhere uh, around 20 hertz or something, so this is not too fast. The time a constant is, is 4 milliseconds for this device. And the noise equivalent power is 27 picowatt per root hertz, and uh, we estimated that this should be about a factor of 10 better, so we there's something not completely right there. So, to sum up, uh, so silicon is very good material to investigate the properties of nanoscale structures because of the, the high quality of the material, because one can use all kinds of processes, it's very standard, all the parameters more or less are well known. So the thermal properties uh, depend strongly on the thickness and of the surfaces. Electrical characteristics does not that much. So there are actually two different uh, uh, parameters that one can, or, or properties that one can change to optimize the thermal uh, properties. And, and then these are the kind of uh, obvious uh, applications. And uh, I think this may be the most interesting and important. Yes. So. Thank you. No, not on the membrane, but the silicon nitride film. Yeah. Well, I just <laughs> skipped this one, but um, this is <laughs> so the phase velocity tends to 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 change, and then it goes. It doesn't go to zero when there's when there's a strain in in the membrane, and this is the measurement, and then this is the model calculation. So there is effect. Few times, few times, few times, ten to nineteen. Well, it depends a little bit what what uh, literature you take. <laughs> it's it's not uh, outrageous, actually. It could be yes, but uh, but. Uh, this is the first first experiment or first device and um, of course if one think about the electrical properties, I mean the mobility or con conductivity, electrical con conductivity goes down in thin membranes so maybe the Seebeck still goes up but then of course the sigma, so it's a trade-off in that case. <laughs> 